Hello, dear audience. Most welcome to this special show of Jomuna TV Talk with Robert Dixon. This is Mahfuz Mishu. Will be with you, and we are happy to welcome the British High Commissioner, His Excellency Robert Dixon, to our studio. Excellency, most welcome to Jomuna Television. Thank you very much. Uh, you were here almost for one month. Two months. Two months. Yeah. It's very little, but how life is going here in Dhaka? Well, it's been it's been brilliant. I'd say two things. The first is we've had a fantastic Bengali welcome from everybody. Uh, it's been really, really great the way we've been able to engage with people at every level. Uh, I've already been able to travel around the country and I'm, it's been a fascinating uh, introduction to Bangladesh uh, and I'm really grateful to everyone for that. The second thing is I'm very struck by just how much there is to the relationship. I mean, Britain is very important to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is very important to Britain. That's increasing uh, as we seek a global future outside the European Union. As Bangladesh emerges yeah. into middle-income country status, the relationship becomes even more important and I'm thrilled to be here and charged as British High Commissioner with the person to make that happen. Yeah. You know, uh, Britain is our trusted friend from the very beginning of our birthhood in 1971. You know, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman first went to yeah. Britain before entering into his own homeland. Uh, how do you evaluate the present bilateral relation? I think the re it's very strong. And there's, the great thing about it is it's got multiple dimensions. So there are 600,000 people of Bangladeshi heritage in the UK. So yeah. there's a very strong people-to-people -people relationship. There's a very strong trade relationship where Bangladesh is third largest export destination uh, with the second largest provider of foreign direct investment. We have a very large development program. We have a very good relationship on defence and security. And of course, we have cricket. So we're about to yeah. welcome the Tigers to Britain for the, or to England and Wales for the World Cup. Uh, and that's another really important dimension. So some, uh, some days ago, uh, the strategic dialogue held between Bangladesh and UK. So do you think Bangladesh is now your strategic partner? And if yes, then why Bangladesh is your strategic partner? Well, I think there's a number of things. The first thing is that this is, South Asia is a region that's clearly yeah. developing very quickly economically. We have important relationships with India, with Pakistan, but also with Bangladesh. Bangladesh is an important part of the South Asia region. And as the region as a whole grows economically and as Bangladesh grows, this is obviously a place where we're you know, these relationships and partnerships become even more important. And the thing that I was really struck by in the strategic dialogue was the breadth of our relationship. So we talked about people to people, we talked about defence, we talked about development, we talked about uh, cultural relationships, we talked about using things like the Cricket World Cup, and we also talked about the way in which we're going to use the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh in two years' time, 2021. 2021. It's going to be a really good opportunity for us to sort of uh, refresh the relationship for the second 50 years. The first 50 years, we've had tremendous... There's obviously a tremendous role that Britain played, as you said, in 1971. That's still going to be very important. But we want to remind everyone of the current relationship, which is broad, deep and important to both sides. And we want to find high-profile ways in 2021 of really, really setting that out to the public at both ends. You know, Brexit... Uh, discussion on Brexit is going on, and uh, then it will be uh, out of European Union. And it's very important for you as well as very much important for Bangladeshi people also because uh, some Bangladeshi people still thought if Brexit happened, then the trade relation between Bangladesh and UK uh, may hamper. Uh, what will you say? Well, I mean, Brexit obviously is unfolding uh, in front of us. Uh, there's a very active debate going on in our parliament. And I can't at the moment predict exactly how it's going to end up, but we have a deadline for leaving the European Union of the 31st of October this year. Yeah. Uh, and I think one way or another, the government will work very hard to make sure that that happens. But what I would say, I think, is that um, whatever happens on Brexit, the relationship with Bangladesh will remain very important. You know, the trade relationship, the economic relationship, the development relationship, the defence relationship, regardless of where we come out on the precise details of our relationship with Europe, those aspects of the relationship with Bangladesh will be very important to us in Britain and to people here in, here in Bangladesh. So Brexit is obviously a huge issue for us in the UK, but it's actually not an enormous issue for the relationship between our two countries, which is growing and strong, whatever happens there. So we can hope uh, bilateral relations will not hamper whatever the Brexit happened or not? No, and I think the strategic dialogue was a really good reminder. Of course, yeah. we discussed Brexit because it's part of our overall global position. Uh, but we've spent most of our time talking about the relationship between Britain and Bangladesh in all its many dimensions. And as I said, it's very broad, it's very deep, it's very strong, and it's growing as the economy here grows. And as Britain becomes more reinvested in South Asia, this relationship becomes more important. Excellency, I want to know your view about uh, Rohingya crisis. You know, Bangladesh uh, is suffering from this crisis, and it's a big headache for the country. And uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar have signed some understanding repatriation was supposed to happen, but it's not happened really. 
Uh, do you think uh, the Rohingya people will go back to their homeland very recently? Is there any possibilities found? And if not, then how you can help Bangladesh in this regard? Well, we're very clear that the right place for the Rohingyas is, is back at home. Um, you know, they were sub there were terrible crimes committed, which is yeah. the reasons why they fled. Uh, and we want them to return as soon as they can do it with dignity, safety and on a voluntary basis. Now, clearly, given that there is still a conflict going on in Rakhine State, where they came from, that may not happen soon. So we and everyone else who's involved with this are enormously grateful. I mean, the response of Bangladesh to this crisis has been incredibly generous and open-hearted. Uh, we have worked with the government of Bangladesh to, um, on the humanitarian needs for those people. We've spent £130 million yeah. uh, so far. There is likely to be more money to come. So what we want to do now is to make sure that the people who are here, while they are here, they can live in dignity and security. The children can be educated. The adults, where possible, can earn a living so they're not dependent. But we recognise also that the arrival of a million people has had a major impact on the local community in Cox's Bazaar, around Cox's Bazaar. So we are also providing support not just to the refugees but also to the, Local to the host community, exactly, to the people, the 350,000 people who were living there when the million people came across mm. the border. So both of those communities need our support. They're both receiving our support. And as I said, we're very clear that the right long-term solution for this crisis is for the Rohingyas to be able to return to their homes in conditions of dignity and safety. And while they're here in Bangladesh, receiving the very generous support of Bangladesh and the international community, it's very important that they are, as I said, able to earn a living and the children can be, can be educated. Uh, but the basic problem is uh, these people are very, much, uh, they are very much afraid of going back there because still the situation in their homeland is not safe. Uh, and the main headache of Bangladesh is to repatriate them to their own land. And uh, the P5, the powerful five members in the UN Security Council, uh, two members always in against of uh, or in favor of Myanmar, in against of Bangladesh unfortunately. So uh, you are always with us. Uh, so do you think uh, UN should play a more effective role in this regard? Um, well, it's a, it's a difficult problem because, as you've said, you know, there are, the Myanmar does receive support in the Security Council. We've been very active in the Security Council. We're what's called the pen holder. So we've been, we've been, try, we've been pushing particularly for accountability. I mean, clearly appalling crimes were committed, which is the reason why the Rohingyas fled in the summer of 2017. We're very clear that the people who committed those crimes should be held to account. Um, but trying to do that and at the same time create conditions where they can return to Rakhine is inevitably going to be a long process. The UN is part of the answer. The International Criminal Court is likely to be part of the answer. Um, we think that ASEAN could be part of the answer. Um, and we also think, to be honest, this crisis is clearly bad for the Rohingyas. Uh, it's obviously bad for Bangladesh. It's had a huge impact. But we also think it's bad for, for Myanmar because Myanmar you know, has a civilian government for the first time yeah. for many years. It's trying to emerge onto the world stage as a, as a, if you like, a normal country able to prosper and develop. And that's been made much harder by the fact that there's been this terrible crimes committed uh, and it's caused a large number of people to flee. Now, clearly, that's not the way that a normal country behaves. So we think that Myanmar should also be thinking about ways in which it can encourage the Rohingyas to return so that Myanmar can resume its, if you like, development journey with its international partners. What's your evaluation regarding the Vashanchar project? Uh, you know, government have a plan to take back the Rohingyas in this special area. Yeah, I mean, we, we're obviously well aware that the government has put a big investment into Vashanchar, and we can yeah. absolutely see the argument for lessening the pressure in Cox's Bazaar. Um, what's important, I think, is that anyone who goes to Vashanchar should do two... There's two things that are important. One is that uh, the United Nations, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, that UNHCR. agency... UNHCR should agree that it's right that people should go there. And secondly, uh, anyone who goes there should go there on a voluntary basis. Now, at the moment, uh, UNHCR are still considering the conditions in Bashanchar and whether they can make a recommendation that people should be moved there. And until that happens, then it hasn't really been possible to try and identify people who might want to go and live there among the Rohingya community. So we're a couple of steps back from actually being able to implement it. But we very much recognise the investment and the effort that the government have put into trying to relieve the congestion in the camps, which remains a, a serious problem. Uh, many, we are, find, we, we, are, we are finding sometimes that there are some big countries who want to see the Rohingya crisis as a bilateral crisis between Bangladesh and Myanmar. Do you really think it's a bilateral crisis? If there's 11 million, uh, if there's uh, millions of people living here, they might be go in the, some wrong path. You know the challenges of uh, extremism also in this region. 
So is it really a bilateral crisis or it's a regional or global crisis? I think I would define it as a regional crisis with a global dimension. So, you know, clearly the immediate crisis is on the border and is, is on the, this side of the border in Bangladesh where people came. Yeah. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crisis with a much wider dimension. Clearly there's a wider threat to regional security if you have a large population who've been displaced. There's lots of examples around the world of how that can have a serious impact. And I think what happened, what appears to have happened in Myanmar was an affront to global civilized values, which is why you have the United Nations Security Council, the International Criminal Court and others and ASEAN, regional organizations, all involved in trying to find a solution. So as I said, it's, it's bilateral, yes, but it's also regional and therefore it's global. Also multilateral. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, what I would say is that we in Britain, you know, the government of Bangladesh have been very clear with me since I arrived here that this is a real crisis for Bangladesh. It's got big economic, social, environmental security issues uh, that it raises for Bangladesh. And Bangladesh wants the help of its friends to try and resolve the crisis. And we in Britain are very clear that we are absolutely alongside Bangladesh in trying to do that. We all are celebrating uh, World Press Freedom Day on December, you know. And you are very much, uh, especially the Britain government is very much advocating on press freedom. What do you really mean by press freedom, especially in the Britain? Well, what we mean by press freedom is the ability of the newspapers to report the news in a factual, objective way uh, without pressure from anywhere, whether that's commercial pressure, political pressure, pressure from... Uh, you know, from, uh, from any, anyone who might be trying to influence the agenda. Now, clearly, anyone who publishes news has an opinion, and one recognises that part of the value of a diverse media environment is that you get views from, from everywhere. Uh, and what's important is that all those voices can be heard. So, provided people are publishing in a responsible way, it's right that their voices can be, can be heard. Yeah. Um, you are very a short time in Bangladesh, but you have the chance to talk with the senior media persons. You have visited some media houses and obviously you have the chance to talk with the media people. How do you value the press freedom situation here in Bangladesh? Well, it's very interesting because I've, I've met a lot of really talented people in Bangladeshi media. Uh, we hosted an event in the High Commission a couple of days ago on, on media freedom. And I'm really struck by the quality and commitment of the journalists, you know, the, the media community uh, here in Bangladesh, including here at Jumina TV. Um, so I'm struck by that. I'm struck that it's a very Bengali, Bangladeshi uh, way of doing things to debate, to argue, you know, to have things out properly, to go through issues in, in detail. Um, so I see a, a very diverse media community, lots of newspapers, lots of television stations, lots of online content. I see, uh, as I said, a very a culture which values engagement, discussion, debate. But I also see Bangladesh at 150 in the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index. And it seems to me that you know, trying to reconcile those three things is, is, is not straightforward. So clearly there are issues around media freedom and concerns about that here. And we are very keen to do what we can on World Press Freedom Day and through the conference that we're hosting globally in London in July to make sure that, you know, the values of press freedom are projected and recognised here in Bangladesh because it's a really important part of the ability of any democracy to hold institutions to account, to hold the powerful to account uh, and for democracy and politicians to be able to do their job. Um, uh, media must be free and independent, but as well as sometimes media should have some responsibilities also. Do you think a responsible media is also uh, necessary for the democracy? Um, well, I think it's very important that voices are free, but equally there are things in, in any society which are uh, highly inflammatory. I mean, the way it was once put, uh, I think in a Supreme Court case in the US, was that people are free to speak, but you're not free to shout fire in a crowded theater. So clearly, you need to bear in mind the impact of your words. You know, there is a responsibility that comes with the, uh, you know, with the ability to speak on a public platform. Um, but it's very important that responsibility isn't seen as a way of shutting down debate. It's very important that opinions, debates, facts can be had freely, while at the same time, people who are using those platforms recognize the potential impact of what they're saying and do so in a responsible way. Uh, you know about Digital Security Act, uh, mm. the journalist and other um, thinkers are very much worried about it and sometimes we found uh, that our development partners like you, USA, they are also concerned about it. What's your latest uh, stand regarding Digital Security Act? Well, I think what I would say, I mean, I, it's not for me to comment on the details of uh, legislation here in Bangladesh, but what I would say is that very clearly there are aspects of the Digital Security Act that do cause concern to people in the Bangladeshi media and if that is part of the reason why Bangladesh is featuring at 150, in the World Press Freedom Index, and it seems to me to be something that it would be worth, um, worth reconsidering. 
so it's that impact uh, as experienced by journalistic practitioners one would hope that uh, people might take notice of. Okay, Excellency, now it's time for a break. We will be back within a few minutes and we have a lot of questions to you. Uh, dear audience, it's time to take a short break and hope you will be with us. Welcome back audience, you are watching a special show of Jamuna TV talk with Robert Dixon. His Excellency Robert Dixon is with us, the British High Commissioner to Dhaka. Uh, several times you have said about good governance and corruption and you said these are big issue for an investor also. How do you evaluate the governance system and corruption index here in Bangladesh? Um, well obviously there are concerns about corruption and I think for Bangladesh the, the point is that Bangladesh is it's a stunning achievement in the last yeah. 50 years there's been an incredible achievement by Bangladesh, especially economically especially economically but I think we would argue that the sustainability of that economic that remarkably economic achievement depends on institutions that work and the thing I would look at is the ease of doing business the World Bank ease of doing business ranking which at the moment has Bangladesh at 176 that's because of concerns about institutions and corruption and I think if Bangladesh is going to attract international capital, which is what's going to be needed for the next stage of economic development, then it would be much easier to do that if some of those concerns about ease of doing business and corruption were, were addressed. So I think there is a really important point for Bangladesh about trying to improve those things in order to make th the leap to a sustainable uh, middle income country. Yeah. Uh, and you have told about bilateral trade. How do you evaluate the bilateral trade situation? Is it really improving? And did you find any challenge to investment here in Bangladesh, especially the UK investor? Obviously, they are communicating with you before investing here. Yeah, I think UK investors are really interested in Bangladesh because it's obviously it's the world's eighth largest country, yeah. and it's growing now. We hope next year at eight percent. So that's a real economic success story, and companies are very interested in that. I think it is fair to say at the moment that 176 on ease of doing business is not yeah. helpful in marketing Bangladesh, in marketing the success story internationally. So we do hope that the government is going to do more to address those issues. Um, but British investors, have, as I said, are interested. The British companies are here. I mean, there are major companies, Unilever, HSBC, yeah. Standard Chartered. Some of the big companies here are British. They have a very good experience here. But trying to get new companies in is more challenging. And I'm going to be working with my opposite number, the Bangladeshi uh, High Commissioner in London, to try and, try and you know, Im improve awareness among British companies of what is possible uh, in Bangladesh. Um, on the overall trade relationship, at the moment, we in Britain import about four billion pounds a year, yeah. four billion dollars a year, sorry, of Bangladeshi goods. We export about 450 million. So there is an enormous trade deficit yeah. with Bangladesh, which is good for Bangladesh, but not so good for Britain. And I'm very keen to try and help British companies to sell more here, to make it a more even partnership uh, on trade and investment. And I think as Bangladesh becomes richer and, and you know, more prosperous as a country, the sort of things, goods and services that British companies sell will become more affordable and more attractive to consumers and, and companies here in Bangladesh. So I'm optimistic about the relationship, uh, but you don't have to be Donald Trump to think that it would be good if we had a more even partnership at the moment. Yeah. What, are, what are the observations of the new investor who want to invest here in Bangladesh? What kind of difficulties they are facing? Uh, sometimes we talk with them, they said uh, it's a systematic problem. They have to go many places for any clearance or any certificate or investment certificate. Do, is it really a big problem here in Bangladesh? And have you told it uh, with uh, talk with the foreign office or the any government official? We've had we've had many conversations, of course, about about these issues. Um, what I would say is that I think it's I think it's partly you know the the experience of companies that know how to operate here is is generally a good one. You know, yeah. there's a very rapidly increasing you know, there's a rapidly growing economy. You've got increasing numbers of consumers who can afford to buy the sort of things that international companies produce. That's all great. Um, the problem, I think, is that when new companies are considering where they might invest, and of course they can invest anywhere in the world, and they look at a country like this, they think the growth is very impressive. They think, you know, there's an awful lot of good things here. There's clearly a massive demographic dividend potentially for Bangladesh with 44 million children in school. You know, there will be a lot more potential consumers in the future. But when you say to them, well, actually, doing business here is pretty difficult, that I think means that they tend to want to put their money elsewhere. You know, there are lots of countries they can go to where those problems are less apparent. 
So I do think there's a real challenge for Bangladesh as it becomes a middle-income country and as it needs to compete to attract international capital, then it's really important that those sort of institutional ease of doing business governance issues are addressed in a way that is convincing to um, international companies. Uh, DFID and UK aid uh, through these two institutes, you are a big development partner of Bangladesh. And did you find any challenge to implement those uh, projects here in Bangladesh? No, I think the DFID have had a very good experience here. I mean, if you're looking at countries, if, you, if you're trying to point to a country where aid has made, where development has been a real success, then Bangladesh is remarkable. I mean, you've got a combination of really well-used international assistance, but you've also got a huge amount of um, Bangladeshi-delivered uh, yeah. development pro success. You've got company, uh, uh, NGOs like BRAC, like Grameen Bank, who are globally recognised for what they have done to lift millions of people out of poverty. Um, but I think what you need to have for the next stage, you know, for sustainable development from LDC, from least developed country to mm -hmm. middle income country stage, is what is needed is a, f a private sector that is able to really get on and do its job and create wealth and lift people out of poverty. Uh, and that's where I think you do come back down again to ease of doing business. And I think our own development programme here is likely over the next two or three years to shift from being uh, delivered around sort of basic development, it's likely to shift to being more support for um, economic reform and for addressing exactly those issues that I mentioned in terms of transparency, institutional capability, those sort of issues which are needed to uh, really make the transition to middle income country status really sustainable. Yeah, you know Bangladesh success about MDZ, Millennium Development Goal, as well as especially Bangladesh success in uh, women empowerment, girl education, uh, mortality rate is very much praised all over the world as well as the climate change issue. Bangladesh is very much, um, globally, Bangladesh is very much uh, famous for it. So what, what are the major challenges to SD, uh, become a middle income country by 2021? You know the vision of the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina. Yeah, and I think, I think as I say, the development success story has been, has been remarkable here. You know, across a wide range of development indicators, you know, the Bangladesh story is one of, is one of real success. And it's a sign of how, even though a country has a very challenging start, it can build its own fortunes. You know, it can it can it can really develop in a way that is largely driven from here, but has made very effective use of also of international help. As I say, I think the challenge now is that to become a, a middle-income country on a sustainable basis needs a private sector, in particular, that is able to really generate uh, wealth, able to really employ large numbers of people. There's been a huge success story in the ready-made garments field and obviously that has all sorts of dimensions around logistics, testing, as well as the manufacture of the garments themselves. But I think what seems to me as an outsider to be needed now is to repeat that success in, in other sectors and that's going to need uh, private capital, private investment to come in from other parts of the world. And that means that companies need to be able to look at the very attractive growth statistics, the very attractive demographic statistics here, but also be confident that their contracts are enforceable, that they can find the labour force they need that basic security is looked after, that infrastructure will be improved. And, and for those things, um, as I said, that's what's really captured by this phrase, ease of doing business. And that's what really needs to be addressed uh, for that uh, remarkable success, that economic success to be, to be continued and, and built on. Excellency, you must will be agree with that politics uh, will define everything uh, because end of the day, politician or the lawmaker, they rule over the country. And how do you evaluate the political situation here in Bangladesh? Um, well, I mean, clearly we made clear at the time that we had some issues around uh, how the elections were conducted, uh, and our minister was clear about that, uh, and you know that remains our, our public position. But having said that, I think what's important now uh, is that we have a situation in which there can be genuinely competitive politics, because our view is that where you have effectively non-competitive politics, that's when that's an environment in which corruption can flourish, in which institutional transparency becomes degraded. So what's needed is for other voices to be able to be heard. So it's very good, I think, personally, that the, you know, the BNP have now taken their seats in Parliament. I think it's very important that although there aren't very many of them in Parliament, they are able to do the job of an opposition. They're able to hold the government to account. They're able to be constructively critical yeah. of what the government is doing. And it's very important also that other, media, other actors, including media, including civil society, are able to challenge the government in a constructive way uh, and hold the government and the institutions to account. And that's how good governance helps to lead back into economic development. You are talking about good governance, but the big institution, the constitutional institution, like Election Commission, like Public Service Commission, like Anti-Corruption Commission, they are also working here in Bangladesh. You have some project also with uh, perhaps uh, Election Commission. 
uh, to strengthen their capacity as well as you have some project, uh, you had some project with Bangladesh police uh, to improve their capacity training and other project earlier times. How do you evaluate this institution are really working well? Well, I think the, you know, the, the, the performance, if you like, of the institutions varies as it does in, in any country. And as I say, what I think is likely to happen to our development program over the next two or three years as Bangladesh transitions is that we will be working with uh, the institutions that are really crucial to giving the right basis for economic development to continue. And that's where we're going to be, where we're going to be focusing. Yeah, uh, extremism and terrorism is the biggest challenge nowadays all over the world. You know, the world situation is going on, especially the New Zealand. And after the holy artisan attack here in Gulshan, Dhaka, Bangladesh is not out of their reins. So, uh, how do you feel? Do you feel really safe here in Bangladesh, or uh, we have we have a view exchange program, we have information exchange program between government to government agency, to agency? Do you feel it's a big challenge also for the Bangladesh nowadays? I think international security, and I mean terrorism is a threat everywhere. We've just been reminded by the appalling events in Sri Lanka uh, the weekend yeah. before last that terrorists can strike in the most brutal and callous and appalling way anywhere in the world. Um, I think the fact that the, Bangla that the, the attacks in Sri Lanka happened in, our, in this region is obviously a reminder that you know, there is a continuing challenge. The fact that uh, Daesh has been defeated in Syria yeah. doesn't mean it's been defeated globally. And the, you know, the poisonous ideas and the capabilities are clearly elsewhere. Um, I think we have a very good relationship with our colleagues in the Bangladeshi, um, in, the, in the parts of the Bangladeshi government that we deal with on these matters. Uh, we have a very candid relationship. We as the international community look very carefully at what is going on here. Um, I personally feel very safe and well looked after, but it's one of those situations where you can never relax your guard. You know, you need vigilance. Uh, you need to be continuing to look at uh, what is going on. Uh, you need to be looking at where the threats might be. Uh, and you need to be looking at the global picture. So we are having those conversations all the time with significant parts of the government here. Uh, and we are doing that also with our international partners. So we, 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 we keep up our guard. Uh, vigilance is the price of liberty, as I think it's been said. Uh, it's also the price of safety in, a, in an era when terrorists can strike at any time. Sometimes uh, the people of Bangladesh, especially the, uh, some agencies, on the very first they thought it's a police problem, it's a law inform in enforcement problem. Uh, terrorism and extremism, but uh, later then we came to a decision that it's a social problem. So if uh, you think about long term to protect this kind of issues, it should have a social impact to award the people. Do you think Bangladesh is now on the right track to combat terrorism and extremism? Um, well, I think I absolutely agree that terrorism is a you know it's, it, it, you can't as we say in the, in the UK you can't arrest your way out of out of a prob out of the problem uh, because. Clearly, there are people who are involved and they need to be pursued, but there's a much wider issue, which is about addressing the social and uh, political causes of terrorism. And we work with the government of Bangladesh on that. It's not a problem we've solved in the UK. I mean, we have our own terrorist issues in the UK, so no country has completely solved this problem. But I think it is important in counterterrorism policy that we're addressing the root causes, the ideas, yeah. um, ideology, the ideology. Exactly, they need to be addressed, and, and uh, you know, they need to be challenged. Um, at the same time as you're also keeping a very vigilant idea of who might be you know, planning attacks and you're, you're, you're trying to make, uh, you know, trying to preempt those attacks before they happen. So you need to address it at all levels. Uh, and I think, you know, the government here has done a pretty good job of that. Um, but you can never say we've done enough because it's a problem that continually evolves. Yeah, you have done several meetings with government officials uh, as well as last uh, last um, strategic dialogue. And in all the meeting, one issue raised from the Bangladesh side, and that is Mr. Tariq Rahman, the acting chairperson of Bangladesh Nationalist Party (BNP). Bangladesh government would like to back him because he is. Uh, they want to uh, back him, Bangladesh, and because he is uh, convicted by the highest court. Uh, what's your stand regarding this? Is Bangladesh really officially sent you any letter or any mail to take back him? And if yes, then is it possible to back him? Well, we never comment on individual cases. Uh, as you say, Mr. Rahman is in the UK. I can't comment on his exact status there. Uh, what I would note is that anyone in the UK, including him, but not just him, uh, has access to a very wide range of legal safeguards. Uh, and so any decision on whether he would or would not be sent back to Bangladesh is one that would be taken by our courts who are independent of our government. So that's not the executive decision or your foreign ministry or home ministry decision. That's the decision of will be the UK court. It's a decision for our courts. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, Cricket World Cup is knocking at the door, and our boys are on the way to uh, London. You know, uh, and it's a huge. Uh, you know, Bangladesh people are very much cricket learning people. Uh, so it's a big chance for you to make the cricket diplomacy here in Bangladesh. What's your plan during uh, World Cup cricket? Uh, well, we already had we had a big national day celebration uh, last week. We had the Tigers on the stage alongside us, which was great. We gave them a send off. Uh, I wish them luck in every match except the one they play against England on the 8th of June, where I hope that perhaps the result is different. Uh, but it would be really great to have an England-Bangladesh final uh, in yeah. July. And I'm very pleased. I mean, it's obviously a real tribute to the, you know, the success of the Tigers as a team, that they are they're going to England for the, for the World Cup. Uh, and I hope they have a really good uh, time there. I hope they have a great visit, uh, a successful sporting visit. Uh, I hope England wins in the end, but I hope it's in a final against Bangladesh. Uh, and I hope that the many Bangladeshi fans who are travelling are also you know, receive a warm English and Welsh welcome uh, and are able to support their team with all the fervour and passion that they're famous for. Thank you very much, Robert Dixon, for your valuable time on Jomuna Television. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now it's time to say bye. I hope you like the show and uh, stay tuned with Jomuna Television. Thank you very much.